Now, lady and gentlemen, we are going to now pose some questions to you. We have been talking about productivity enhancement through literacies. We've had a very good start. Mr. Dr. Dr. Charles Douglas gave us definitions. He outlined to us the need to ensure that we have value for money. He talked about, and looking back on his notes, just getting my notes together to make sure I'm not saying Dr. Douglas said when it was Dr. Brown or when it was Dr. Cross. He went through the whole economic definition and he went through earlier on the philosophical definitions. He took us through a number of benefits as well. And um, then he talked about the implications and uh, the drivers of productivity, some of the broad headings that he spoke about. So we are asking you to prepare yourself to ask questions. To remind you that Dr. Brown uh, continued that discussion and um, one of the phrases that he picked up on from Dr. Charles Douglas's presentation was handling of the goods. And then he talked about the need to understand that we in today's world are moving beyond basic literacy but that's where we all come in and so it's important that we do the correlation between productivity and uh, enhancement through literacies and we have our very own dr cross taking us through the understanding of what it is to be literate and hence the reason why we looked at some of the definitions they are coming out of UNESCO and the statistic that she referred to. Literacy is a means for development, enabling a people to access opportunities and to participate in society in new ways. I'm going to ask Mr. Richard Williams to add his comments to that if he is so prepared to do or if he's just in a position to field questions based on the theme and indeed on the presentations that were, that just preceded. You will come. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's really my pleasure to be here to participate in an activity of this nature. And as I sat there, I had to relearn some things. I'm a little timid to even share now because I'm like relearning some things. Thank you, Dr. Cross. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> But um, basically, uh, the Early Childhood Commission is strategically placed at this time to work with the early childhood sector, with all the children, birth to eight years in early childhood institution. But not only that, we don't only work with the, the children, we are actually involved with the parents and the practitioners of the children because there are things that we can do with the children, but most of all, we have to get to the parents and the practitioners. And so we are quite happy with where we are in the sense that we are at a point where we can reach a wide cross-section of the population to impact the, the, the different kinds of learnings and literacies that will take place as we go along. And as we have recently implemented our curriculum, uh, it's not just about individual or group cooperative learning, but it's about each child being tapped into, into his, his or her own possibilities. And so from an early childhood perspective, we are looking forward to the work that will be done over the ensuing years, three to five years, to see what the, the, the outputs and out, outcomes will be of, of the children. It's very important that we take a critical look at how we interface and interact with our children from birth. It means, therefore, that our homes should be centers where communication is critical. And if we don't have all the technological gadgets, there are places that we can go to access so that we can expose our children and ensure that they are on the cutting edge with all the information and literacy skills that they need to have as they grow so that they are befitted for not just Jamaica, but for the global society. And I'll cut it there. Moderator, are you going to walk the microphone? 
I guess. I guess we could do that. As I walked around, I noticed that a number of persons were actively taking notes. To be honest, it, it was very, very, very useful information. And I'm going to immediately put somebody on the spot, one of our board of directors. Looking very fluent and warm. Apart from saying words of congratulations right now, she would really want to speak with us this afternoon. So let's put the back. Now put on the spot. Director of promotion for the land of Maryland. Thank you very much, Miranda. <laughs> Um, just to say very quickly, oh, I, I was absolutely blown away by the presentation, uh, Dr. Douglas, I learned so much. I mean, I've heard you presented before, but you were probably at your best today. Um, my question is to uh, Mr. Williams, because in Dr. Potts' presentation on the 21st century literacy, um, and I learned so much, Alison, and I thought that you, but really, you, you took so much new information to the process, and, and I was very impressed with that. <laughs> so the question to you, therefore, Mr. Williams, representing the Early Childhood Commission, based on what Dr. Cross said about the 21st century literacy, I noted carefully that she said it's no longer about the three hearts. She spoke to the four C's. Um, and you spoke uh, just now about the fact that the early childhood curriculum has been revised. revised. And I wondered if, based on what Dr. Post said, whether or not that curriculum has represented those four C's at that particular level. Because I think that's where it needs to start. Because I'm um, amazed at my three-year-old niece who uses the internet like it's just a pen or a pencil. <coughs> Because that's, that's the key for her. And so, even at that age, they are able to use those four seeds and use it very adequately. So that's my question. Has the curriculum been properly valid that it represents the differences that were mentioned? Thank you very much, Board Director. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the, the question. Uh, the revised French curriculum does uh, represent the four C's critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, uh, the activities in the curriculum. First of all, the curriculum can be accessed on the ECC website at www.ecc.gov.jf. So everybody can access it and look to see where they can get um, activities, information on how the process goes. You, you spoke of your granddaughter. Yes. Uh, these are any child entered an early child institution that uses the Jamaican early child curriculum. Once they get into a classroom or an institution that promotes a curriculum, there are activities, including computer activities. Uh, just about first of all, the, the environment is so set up that it features individuality. A child is able to do his or her creative work on his own, facilitated by the teacher. We have to work with the, the practitioners that we have based on the level that they're at in order to get to the point where they're able to understand that it's not about a teacher on the stage or a sage on the stage, but a guy on the side to facilitate that kind of learning. Uh, it's not about you planning to come to teach about the letter A and children have their specific needs and so it's individual that you might have 15 children in the class is 15 individuals you have to work with and so you have to facilitate that and the activity is a center base so a number of uh, learning centers will be created for children to go on the interface with different objects colors shapes activities uh, whether it's creative scientific numeracy literacy activity so that they can improve on their skills Thank you very much. A question to you, Dr. Douglas. We are talking about the 21st century, and um, uh, Dr. Cross spoke to that. But in a, in a situation where we are having the kind of crisis in the, in the country 
and worldwide with the contraction as a result of what is happening in the in the in the various economies because of what's the term that they use um, recession because of this recession and, and it now double dip recession how how would you advise us as human beings because it's as if they're talking about machines to respond to such a theme and especially how you have brought the statistic to us about one percent two percent and so on how do we respond or how do organizations therefore treat their workers in this regard i think it's a um it's a very compact question you're, you're, you're posing and um but let me let me start um from scratch let me say for example when we when we think about productivity and we're trying to measure productivity, um, we usually look at trends. So for example, if there's a recession for two or three years, um, we, we don't use that to, to make projections. We look at a longer term, longer term uh, trend. But essentially, since we, we the, it, Inflation, um, recession usually affects people um, in, in the sense that it reduces the, in many instances, the, the um, disposable income. Um, it means that people have to find creative ways to, to um, sustain their standard of living, if you will. And um, one of the things that I find is quite is quite popular. For example, you find that um, young persons who have difficulty getting jobs in the recession actually continue to advance their education, um, and I think um, it's probably a quite logical and reasonable response because once the recession ends. You're, you're in a stronger position, right? Um, I, I'm not sure if I answer all the questions, but I, <laughs> but there are, there are different different strategies. Um, one of the things that I find interesting about recession also is that um, it puts you in a well. From our experience, certainly at the at the center. What happens is that um, in the recession, people are forced to take actions that they would normally take if it had not been for the, for the recession. So if we look at it from a numerical perspective in terms of the numbers of queries or requests that we have received for, for help, um, and the first thing when you go to these organizations, the first thing they will tell you is that they have just completed a strategic review. In other words, they start to look at their situation quite critically and to see um, how best to navigate the, the tides of the recession, really. Um, so I think we people and businesses um, have, have tried to look critically at what they're doing they try to find um where the waste in their organizations are try to, to remove them try to trim the fat and so on and so forth um i think as the conversation progresses i may be able to say more in terms of the strategies and so on but i'll stop there Dr. Douglas, I was quite impressed with the way that you, you managed to, to attach a, an economic face to literacy, which is sometimes hard to do with literacy and HR and PR and these intangibles. And, but it's very necessary because the decision makers like to think in terms of statistics and numbers. So I was very impressed with that. Um, jumping off from there and, and, and from your background as an economist, the GDP formula includes government spending. In other words, you could spend your way out of a recession. We see the government spending on, on infrastructural activities, etc. at this point. Do you believe that um, money spent at this point, perhaps on literacy, 
would also um, redound to the effect of the nation's future economic prosperity? And do you believe that there should be a renewed focus in that direction? believe that any investment in human capital is something that has to continue and um, most of the research that I've read suggests that the returns to investment in human capital is in the high 70s and so on in, in percentage terms. I, I believe also that um, when you when you invest in, in human capital, what you're doing, you know, you, you, you're creating an intergenerational prosperity thing, right? So it's not just that you're investing in, in one generation, because what would expect that, that investment to spill over into subsequent generations? So I believe that one of the greatest investments that a country can make it is, is in its human resources and its people. Certainly, certainly, we are faced with a dilemma, though, in, in terms of policy dilemma, a policy dichotomy, in the sense that um, in a recession, one would expect that um, these are the times when you would invest more in human capital. But since, since you have less government in, in, um, revenue to spend, Right? Because in a recession, government income decline. So you, you're faced with a chicken and egg situation as to whether you're going to invest in, in say, early childhood education, or you're going to invest in infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And I personally believe that the PIOJ, for example, have a model they call the T21 model. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that that model can do is to tell you, given the, the scenarios you can model, it tells you if you have one more dollar where to put it, where you'll get the highest return to, to that one dollar investment. And I think um, it's a powerful policy tool and I would like to see it being used more in the country. So for example, recently we have had discussion, people talking about, um, people talking about uh, the impact of, say, taxation on electricity, for example, or taxation on fuel, right? I think if one creatively build that into that kind of model, right, and say vary the, the tax rates to see what kind of impact it has on the different sectors and use that to inform policies. I think we... we we, as a country, probably make too many policies without investigating what the follow-through impacts are. And I think what would be useful, if, given that we have that tool, is to use it to experiment, to find out before we institute the policies what will be the impact on, say, employment, what will be the impact on, say, crime, what will be the impact on, say, um, the banking or the financial system, what will be the impact on interest rates? Um, time is up on us and we want to make sure, yes? What are the plans that are afoot? I would think, well, I haven't heard anything being mentioned nationally on a, on a, on a wide range about any training needs analysis that is done with the workforce. Now, it would be my interpretation or my understanding that for us to move ahead and to find out what it is that we need and to, to put things in a strategic process, there needs to be a, a local, a, a wide national training need analysis or a proper job evaluation done with the public and the private sector. I I don't know if I missed, but I didn't hear it being mentioned. So I wanted to know if any plans for that is afoot. I'm, I'm not sure if there has been a, a recent comprehensive analysis of, of training needs, but I certainly believe that... Um, let me try and give you an example of where I'm thinking. Um, in the last five years, we probably had it 
15,000 new hotel rooms. I know that the, that was the plan. Okay? But um, a large number of hotel rooms have been added. I would expect that <coughs> while that was in the pipeline and the construction and so on was taking place, I would, I would expect that it would have been anticipated that these were the needs going to exist. And then, and then the training could be programmed along the, to meet that demand, right? Okay. And I think like um, we, could, we could do other sectors of the economy in a, in a similar way. I think one of the criticisms that I personally have about the, the economic programming aspect in the country is that people have gone to a stage where they are reluctant to pick winners. Right? And because we are reluctant to pick winners, we, are, we, are, we find ourselves in a situation where we can't program the training needs as we don't know the, the demand. Okay? If we're, for example, if we were saying like we want to grow, we want to grow the agricultural sector by 50%, or we want to grow the, the greenhouse component of the agricultural sector by a certain percentage, then we would know that we would need so many technicians that have that specific skill, right? But because we are depending on the invisible hand to take us there, we don't know what the invisible hand is thinking, so we can program the training needs to fit the invisible hand. And I would think like if we take a more proactive role in picking winners and um, um, moving the, the, the training needs accordingly. One of the things I find is that, um, <clears throat> for example, as a country, our planners probably don't don't think about they don't think industry right so for example i remember one time uh, dr tufton talked about promoting cassava production but because the population wasn't thinking along industry they just not thinking commodity so they shut down the idea right because they were thinking they were thinking commodity whereas if they were thinking industry they think of okay once we produce the good we're going to link it up and we're going to have byproducts coming out of it. And we're going to establish what we call a cassava industry then. Right? If we are thinking along that line, then the training needs, right? The training needs could be evaluated and, and, and put in place. Right? So I quite agree with you. Then to bear out our, our theme, productivity enhancement through literacies, the literacy of industries, which is what we're referring to. Okay, I have a question for Dr. Cross. If we continue to do the same things the same way, we'll have the same results, somebody said. Uh, we don't want to use the word madness in this room, but, but we'll have the same results, certainly. Uh, against that, that, that general principle, how important do you consider the need for curricular development and revision across the spectrum of the educational landscape, but particularly in second chance institutions such as ours. Given your own presentation that showed the wide range of literacies that need to be there, the ICT literacies, the, the, the critical thinking, the research-based um, mindset, what kind of culture change needs to happen in the educational system? And, and where, 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 where do you see advocacy as a part of that? How do we deliver better on what we have rather than trying to invent many new structures. That's what I'm going to approach. How do we do better on what we have? So let's look at what we have in terms of curriculum <coughs> development. My colleague talked about the early childhood curriculum. It's a state-of-the-art curriculum. You talk about second chance curriculum, which would be the career advancement curriculum and Jamaican Foundation for Lifelong Learning curriculum. Right now, we are partnering with the Ministry of Education and a team of us, a steering committee, is working together to look at this curriculum and to make it much more dynamic. But it's not so much the curriculum as the, the a curriculum takes into account the content, the trainers, the facilitators of learning, that's the teacher, the learners themselves, and the assessment process. So it's a, a, um, a very authentic and it's a very um, interactive process. And so, it's not so much what is in there, 
but it is a dynamic between the learning outcomes. So if we look at the learning outcomes, and I'm gonna be break it down, drill right down to the micro level. Well, let's, let's go to the macro level. At the macro level, for language skills, for example, this, the skills that you need are for reading, to read, to learn, and to read to gather information. Those are the two main reasons why we read. We read to learn, and we read to gather information. And from that, I can bring, build, or look and see, does our curriculum pan out and do all of that? And then what's the best way to deliver on that curriculum? So the curriculum is a guideline for those overall objectives. First, uh, and part of that, reading is just a small part of the literacy process. So writing, what do we write for? We write to inform and we write to communicate. So again, you drill down and you make sure that it's a, a comprehensive. We need to be able to listen. Listen for what reason? Listen for understanding and so that we're engaged in the process. And then we need to be able to speak, to communicate thoughts again, and, and to get make sure understanding takes place. So there alone, in your language arts curriculum, your themes are broad, and then you drill down and say, and so what does a teaching learning process look like? So it's not so much that we have to revamp our curriculum, it's we have to revamp the mindset as to how we can treat it, not just a curriculum that prepares learners for the classroom, but a, a curriculum and a content and a teaching learning process that are going to prepare people with skills for life, skills for their family, skills for the world of work, skills for the community, skills for democratic process, skills for social responsibility, civic awareness, I could go on and on. So no longer in the, in the 21st century are we interested in skills just for the classroom. And that will therefore translate into increased productivities. Very good. With, with, with just that response alone, we could open a lecture. Give me the, the framework that you have articulated. Um, is the policy makers aware of the, of the complexity of the process or the issues and, um, and the, the implications of that understanding or lack of that understanding for resource allocation? So that's a, that's a great, great question. Fortunately for me, as a, as a head of the agency um, under the Ministry of Education, I'm in a position where I'm able to speak with the policymakers and, and advise and be part of the discussion with the policymakers. And so it is a part of my responsibility to engage in, for example, I was sharing that we are looking at revamping the curriculum for the career advancement program and that was going over. So as part of that process, I'm able to speak with the team at the core curriculum and share. So it's a collaborative effort um, and we are only as good as, as a team effort. Our curriculum is not built with one person's suge suggestion. So I believe that it is the responsibility of those of us who, who, who know and who, and, who, and who have, not I wouldn't say who know, those of us who believe in, in a certain methodology and, and mindset to share and pass on this information so that we all move from lower levels of literacy <laughs> in curriculum development to, to higher levels. So I'm, I'm hoping that because we are part of the process, that we will be able to, to, to create a little influence. Thank you, Dr. Cross. Dr. Douglas, I want to think that you're beginning to feel that we need to have a joint seminar um, because with this understanding, we would be able to reach the masses more because we have to bring it to them as basic as possible for them to understand it. And what I realized here this, this, this afternoon into evening is that really we needed a full day to really, really drill down into this. And um, we are not yet done with such a theme. And we have only extracted uh, three sub-themes to that. Uh, Mr. Williams, we know we could go on and on, but I'm sure that you'll also want to return and be a part of our ongoing series, as we put it. Dr. Cross, your presentation was very, very interesting and insightful. I would love to read it in more details. This is one of your 
or from your audience out across requesting a copy of your of your Okay, okay, is that is that a feel? Wonderful. Okay, literacy is not limited to being able to read and write, but also it includes the ability to use our hands and our bodies and our minds and anything that is a part of our lives to help to develop our environment to carry out our daily tasks and functions. This is a definition that I continue to use from a group of National Youth Service Worker as we discussed the importance of literacy and they came up with that. So that is really, really um, insightful of them. I started out by saying to all of us that